guardian ships are just dead things. We've been blown miles off course. Who knows where we are? I joke about many things, but never about shipbuilding. It's my boat, and the gods love my boat! The ship is like the symbol of the Viking Age. They've been advancing this technology at times when other people had not bothered. It's amazing to me that nobody else had boats anything like them or anything like as efficient. The boats the Franks had were left behind from Charlemagne's age. They were like hulks, they were unmaneuverable. The Saxons had no way of protecting the coastline or rivers from Vikings. One fantastic thing about the Skulelo ships was that it represented five different ship types. Finding these fantastic Skulelo ships allowed us to build reconstructions and then we could do experimental archaeology by building them and by sailing in them. It's a bit difficult to see from the outside, but we can try it from this. Here you can see the plank, it's one plank put into another plank. There is a new overlap here, you can say, and oh, that yes. is exactly how we do our repairs. I can tell which trees will make the best planks just by looking at them. I can look inside the tree. This is one. When you cleave a plank out, you make it very strong because you follow the grain in the tree. And that's the problem with the saw. It will just cut straight, so it will cut all the fibers in the tree. And that's not only the planks, that's also all the curved pieces. You have to go into the forest, find the right piece of curve. You're not cutting over the fibers if you have the right shape on the piece. That's why it's so important for boat builders. If they find the right piece in the forest of an oak tree, you have to bring it home. The advantage of clinker build is that the two planks, when they overlap, then the overlap, it's a kind of a, a strength itself. It's not stiff. The result is flexibility. And if you think like in your modern head, you have to build strong and stiff, it will break when you're going into sea. This means the boat won't butt against the waves like a goat, but move over them like a ripple. as if we can experience exactly the same things at the Vikings did, but you get an idea, and that is how we use experimental archaeology here at the Viking Ship Museum, because you go out and you get an impression of what is it like being on board such a ship, instead of, you know, sitting behind a desk and just reading about it. When I was on board as a crew member, I functioned as a midshipman, which means that I was located here in the middle of the ship, around the mast. What I experienced there was I tried to get an idea of the special conditions for being on board such a long and narrow ship as this is, crewed with 60 people. This is where you would have the helmsman and you would have the skipper or the captain in that sense. The crew seated here would work with the sheets, controlling the sheets of the sail. In the front of the ship, the very front, you would have the lookout. 
which has a very important function on the ship. Hoistos! If you can imagine 60 people here in this very long and narrow ship, and you would have a big square sail, and you would have the elements out there when you're sailing the ship, then it's basically impossible for the lookout here to shout all the way to the aft of the ship. Jump ship! And the way that it has been solved when we are sailing with the sea stallion is that we have used uh, a middleman. This middleman needs to communicate the direct orders from the skipper and the helmsman, which need to be known by the whole crew, obviously. Sail down! The whole experience of being on board, being able to, to be part of that crew, trains you into becoming sort of a very coherent military uh, unit. So my theory is that being on board these ships could be seen basically as a training camp. The ships are shaping the crew. It might be part of the success that the Viking has in their military operation.